if you would take your Bibles, please, and open them to John chapter 12, as we're looking to conclude John chapter 12 this morning. John 12, verses 36b, all the way to the end, verse 50. The foretold unbelief of unbelievers. If you would bow with me as I pray. God, our Father, I sincerely hope that you have been worshipped in spirit and in truth this morning from those of us gathered here at Grace Fellowship. And Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ elsewhere that you will fill the places of worship with your presence and power. God, that we will get a glimpse of you. We will behold you and respond rightly to you. I ask for your help now in preaching as we come back to a a familiar theme that is still very hard for some people to not only grasp, but fully receive and accept gladly. Lord, help me as I seek to honor you first and foremost, but also to be a blessing and an edifier to the people of God. Lord, I also pray for those who are in spiritual darkness, they're blind, they're deaf, or they're spiritually dead, that you today, right now, can give them life. Lord, we know that your heart is full of love and you, you save. So Lord, do that. And Lord, keep showing us that you're the God who saves. I pray these things in your holy name. Amen. Amen. On November 27th, 2022, six weeks ago, and don't worry, I'm not going to get sappy, but that was the day my dad went home to be with the Lord. And I remember preaching that morning afterwards, and it was from John 11, verses 45 to 57. The sermon title was The Unbelievable Unbelief of Unbelievers. I was so proud of myself for that. Well, today's theme is very similar, hence the foretold unbelief of unbelievers. I'll ask a couple of questions. Please don't answer out loud. If you do, you will be disciplined, flogged, (laughs) ran out of town. That's not true. But is God sovereign? Now think about that. God is, I think sovereignty is so clearly presented in his his attributes, but he is all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's good. He's eternally good. There's never been a moment when he hasn't been, or there won't be a moment when he won't be good. He's ever-present. I think the answer is overwhelmingly, yes, God is sovereign. Well, then, a follow-up question. Does man have free will? Does man have free will? I'm going to set that to the side. I feel like I've got a friend right on my shoulder, and I don't, don't want that. I want to answer the question this way. I do think that man has a free will. I just think people take it farther than the Bible allows them to. I do not believe that we have absolute free will. And what I mean by that is that our will is constrained by our nature. I cannot decide to be a bluebird. Now, in today's climate, people, oh, you certainly can. You can identify as anything. Well, then I identify for a moment as Bill Gates, and I want to go to the bank and make a withdrawal. And then quickly identify back as me. No, you are only as free as your will, or excuse me, as your nature permits you to be free. You cannot simply decide that I can change my nature. It doesn't work that way, folks. That's why we need God to change that. We need God to give spiritual life where there is spiritual death. I understand why people sometimes pit these two questions and two thoughts against one another, but I don't think they should. I really don't. In J.I. Packer's book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, he talks about when there's a seeming uh, paradox, if you will, where uh, you have two statements that look to be contradicting one another, but they actually don't. So God is sovereign and man is free. But just understand, there are some parameters, especially on that man is free statement. Jesus is very near his capture, trial, and crucifixion. We're talking a day or so before. And in these last times with the crowds, he is continuing to proclaim what he has been saying from the 
from the beginning that he is the Messiah sent from God. It's undeniable, really. When, if you will objectively come to the Scriptures, you cannot deny that Jesus does make that claim. He makes it repeatedly and then backs it up. So this morning, we're going to see just a little bit more interaction between he and the crowds there in Jerusalem. What, what's really going to be a majority of our study this morning is, is two words, without excuse. God is sovereign. Man does have free will, but man is without excuse. And I know it's a gloomy day outside, and now you're thinking, oh, goodness. Oh, maybe it's nap time. If you see your neighbor you know, getting mad, bored, or asleep, just punch them. Just say, this is, this is for your good. Don't actually punch them. Kids, I, I really, I, I, sometimes I'm, I'm like that. Kids say, well, the pastor said to punch them. Don't, don't. Got your Bibles open, I hope. Hope you do. Let's get ready. John 12. This is a tough one. Verse 36b through 41. Come down to the middle of the verse where it says, When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that, and there's a key word, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Verse 41, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. In this first section, we're looking at the unbelieving heart that openly rejects Jesus as Messiah. And there are plenty of people who are very open and unapologetic about their rejection of Jesus. As much as I want to think that more people will come to know him than those who will not, Jesus' own word says that the road to destruction is broad, many find it. But narrow is the gate to eternal life, and few find it. And this is not about a, a question of, is God powerful enough to save all? Of course he is. Is the, is the satisfactory death of Jesus sufficient to save all? Of course it is. So this isn't about God not being powerful enough to save all. He could. But with his own, within himself, he doesn't save all. And he doesn't give us an explanation as to why. But one of the things that we're going to notice here, and it's something that we've seen before, sufficient evidence is not always convincing for some. I still recall watching that particular movie, I think it was, where a scientist, and it was a female scientist, who said, if I were truly uh, objective, I would have to say at best, uh, or even at, at the least, I'm agnostic. I don't know if there's a God, don't know if we can know. She said, but I don't want there to be a God, so I'm an atheist. Now this is someone who's evidence, 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 test, 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 but then says, I'll put all of that aside if I want this. And that's what we deal with a lot of the time. And to be fair, even Christians can be guilty of that. In verse 36b, after Jesus told the crowd about his soon coming death by crucifixion, judgment being on the world, the ruler of the world being cast out, and that Jesus will draw all people, that's Jew and Gentile, to himself, he then left the crowd and concealed himself from them. This is not running and hiding, if you will, but rather it is not yet time. It's almost time, but not yet. And then in verse 37, there are many amongst the crowd that reject Jesus and his claim to be the Messiah. They have abundant 
sufficient undeniable evidence to go on but still they do not believe in him as messiah and john even states that jesus had done so many signs in their presence but that didn't matter to them folks remember the human heart is a hardened heart i think this is crucial in your theological progression i think one of the biggest things that will shape how you and I think is your view of total depravity. I, I really do think that if you don't get that one down, I think you're gonna be messed up on the other stuff. I do. Well, Darrell, aren't we basically good? No, we're not. In fact, we're told in Psalms, and then Paul repeats it in Romans, there is none good. And it's an absolute term, none none righteous, none who seek after God, none. But, but in my heart, I feel like I'm good. The heart is deceptively wicked above all measure. It's full of murder. Well, I just don't know if I agree with that. Jesus said that. And when we have this view that people are basically good, we are way wrong way off course now there is such a thing as the common grace of god where even evil people can do what would be considered right and good god used old testament kings who were not his people to bless his people god used pagans to do good things to bring about his purposes so because of the common grace of god not every unbeliever goes to the extent of their depravity and sometimes they even do good things you might even say man there's one of my neighbors is an unbeliever, but he's one of the best neighbors you can have. But in the judicial sense, standing before God, none of us are good. Not even one. And people really struggle. Oh, I just don't know if I can accept that. Then you're going to have a lot of problems when it comes to the Bible. You're going to have a whole lot of problems when it comes to the Bible. The human heart is marred by sin and it is stubborn and it is rebellious and unless god breaks that heart unless god grants uh, what's called regeneration life then that heart's going to stay in its dead hateful state it's going to happen folks and that's one of the reasons why when a person says oh well you hold that so you're going to be arrogant friend it's the opposite of arrogance had god not opened my blind eyes broke my hardened heart and given me life i would get the hell that i deserve are you kidding me arrogant i'm not arrogant about that i'm thankful to god that he would show mercy to me i don't know why he did but it certainly isn't an arrogant position some people levy that at you and it's like, no. In verse 38, John tells the reader that this rejection by the unbelievers actually fulfills what the prophet Isaiah had spoken and written over seven centuries earlier. Over seven centuries before, God is talking with Isaiah Isaiah brings forth the word of the Lord, and this is the quote that John gives, Lord, who has believed what he heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And that comes from Isaiah 53, 1. Isaiah 53 is one of the most well-known chapters in the Old Testament. It's known as the suffering servant passage, and it is messianic in nature. Now, there are those in more modern times who will say, well, the Jews really didn't see Isaiah 53 as messianic. For in history is not on their side. It absolutely was seen as messianic by the Jews. They would readily admit that Isaiah 53 was messianic. The problem is, is you have some who would have seen Isaiah 53 as messianic, but then when Jesus talks about having to come live, suffer, and die, they're like, uh-uh, that's not the warrior king we want. It's commonly accepted by many Jews that Isaiah 53 is messianic in nature. In verses 39 and 40 here of John 12, John states that these people, notice this, could not believe. It means they're powerless. Well, you got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You can't. You just got to try hard. You can't. Well, maybe there's something in me. There isn't. 
The text says they could not. They could not will themselves to do this. It's not within them. It's not within their capability. They're powerless to believe. And John connects that back to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 10. What a chapter that one is, where Isaiah is permitted to be in the presence of God, and he recognizes, Lord, I don't deserve to be here. I'm a dead man. The prophet Isaiah allowed to see the Lord, and he does, he does see the Lord. He's told by Yahweh to preach to the people, and then God says, but they won't listen. They will not believe. And that's not unusual. And I know to you and I, we think, why would God send a preacher or prophet on a mission and then say, what you tell them, they're not going to listen to you. Then why go? In Romans 9, the Apostle Paul is talking about how God is the potter and we are the clay and the potter has every right over the clay. And Paul anticipates pushback from his fellow believers there in Rome that, well, this doesn't make sense. And Paul leaves it at this. Who are we? Who are you, oh man, to talk to him like that? There are some things that God does that we are never going to get an explanation for. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord. God doesn't owe us an answer for everything that he does or does not do. And again, I know that it's a struggle because we think we have to have every answer, but we don't. In our reading through the Bible this week, we're in the book of Job. And Job says, I'm going to go to God. I'm going to ask him some questions and he's going to answer. And I'm just going to go ahead and break it to you. If you haven't gotten to the end yet, God doesn't answer. And you know what you find with Job? Job is satisfied with God himself. Folks, sometimes the answers simply bring more questions. But Isaiah, go and preach to this people. They will not believe. Was Isaiah the first one that God said that to? No. Moses, go to Pharaoh. Say this, but he will not hear you. In fact, God said, oh, well, I will harden his heart so that he won't listen to you. But go. What about Jeremiah, the prophet there to the southern kingdom? Preach Jeremiah. They won't listen. I think part of this has to do with the fact that there's no one who can ever say to God, I have an excuse in my unbelief. I think it was Spurgeon who said, no unbeliever will go kicking and screaming into hell saying, I've never had the chance. And Spurgeon was a Calvinist, folks. I know some people want to make the argument that he wasn't, but he was. No one has a legitimate reason to blame God for their unbelief. I told you this is hard. See, Daryl, why didn't you skip this part? Because we don't do that. Why didn't you find another angle for this text? Because there's not one. That quote from Isaiah 6.10, it is the Lord, notice that, the Lord who blinded the people and hardened their hearts. I know it's tough, but it's true. And here's what it's going to come down to, folks. You're either going to say, well, if that's it, then I'm not believing him. Well, then who are you going to believe? It's going to be somebody. It's going to be someone. I'll go ahead and help you out here. Whoever that someone is other than God, they will not give you the answers, the right answers. They, they can't. You will not find satisfaction there. I know this is a struggle, but this comes from the Lord. The thing that helped me most in my own maturity, it really was... I'm coming back to it, grasping that central doctrine known as the doctrine of total depravity. When, when that clicked for me, the rest really just made sense. It, it truly did. In verse 41, I think we have to ask, whose glory did Isaiah see and who did Isaiah speak of? Because John says Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Who is that? What's John been talking about? Who has John been talking about? Jesus. Who did Isaiah see? I think it's undeniable that it's Jesus. Now, there is an argument that says, well, what Isaiah saw was the glory of the Father. But, I mean, you could even argue that the Son is the very glory of the Father. I 
a pre-incarnate form. Isaiah is there in the throne room of God and he saw the Lord. Now, I'm going to step aside just for a moment. Don't worry, it's not too big of a rabbit trail. But years ago, I was in a conversation with someone who's in a cult and they deny that Jesus is God. And their argument went like this, that, that Jesus can be Adonai, but never Yahweh or Jehovah. They actually use Jehovah, it's Yahweh. And they said, you'll never find that reference. And thankfully I'd, I'd been studied up and I had studied Isaiah and I, I took this person to Isaiah chapter six. I said, now you've made an argument here. You've, made, you, you've given me your, your, your cult leader's position. When you look at Isaiah six, the word Lord is used six times. Three times it's Yahweh, and three times it's Adonai, and they're interspersed. So it's not like Yahweh, 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 Adonai, Adonai, Adonai. No, it's Yahweh, Adonai, Adonai, Yahweh. It's interspersed. So what is Isaiah doing? He says, I, I'm seeing the Lord. I'm seeing the Lord. It's God. Now this particular person I knew, I knew, would say, and no one has seen God. That's 1 John 4, 12. I said, but Isaiah saw God. And you have to admit that he saw Yahweh. And I remember the guy was like, oh, gosh. Whew. Hmm. Well, I just don't know if that's right. I said, I can prove it to you. He said, no, I don't need that. I said, Isaiah saw Yahweh. Well, according to you, he saw Adonai and Yahweh. They're, they're the same. I said, who did Isaiah see? Because you agree that no man can see God, but Isaiah saw God. Who did he see? And he wouldn't answer because he knew the answer was Jesus. And he's like, uh-uh, I can't answer Jesus because I don't believe that Jesus is God. Rather than saying, well, the text makes it pretty clear, I can't do that. And by the way, I actually was in John 12 too, or John 12 as well, and that, that's where I was making my argument from. What does that have to do with the unbelieving heart openly rejecting Jesus as Messiah? Folks, we go and we proclaim the gospel. God is holy, we are sinners. Jesus Christ came into the world, eternally God, became man, sinless, sinless at conception, sinless in the, the womb, sinless in life, sinless at Calvary, except the, the sin that was imputed to him, sinless, the perfect substitute. And he died and he was buried and he's raised and he ascended and he's coming back. We proclaim that message. And there are people that even if they had a handwritten note that was undeniable, Jesus wrote this, they would say, I don't believe. And that's not on you and that's not on me. And I'm not saying we shouldn't care. But there are some people, it doesn't matter how much evidence they have, they will reject Jesus and keep rejecting Jesus. They, they will be more in love with their sin than ever admitting that God is holy and they are not. Why does God show mercy on some? Why did he show mercy on me? I don't know. But I know it's not because he saw something good in me. Because there was nothing good found in me. God is sovereign. Man is responsible. I know that there's a tension there and I cannot perfectly connect how those two realities work together, but I believe both are true. God is sovereign. Man is responsible. Verses 42 and 43. In point one, we had the unbelieving heart that openly rejects Jesus as Messiah. I think we're still talking about the unbelieving heart, but here in point two, the unbelieving heart that pretends to believe in Jesus as Messiah. And this is the one that actually worries me because I wonder about how many people are still in this category. Verse 42 of John 12. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. And I know I love that phrase too, but just be careful. We've seen it before where it doesn't mean what we want it to mean. Believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue for they loved the glory that comes from man. God. I remind you that not all faith is saving faith. When you look at the letter of James chapter two, James is dealing with that very reality. 
You say you have faith without works. That's useless and dead. I'll show you my faith by my works. Now, James is saying that a person is justified by faith in Jesus and their works. That is the doctrine of justification from a different angle that Paul was coming from in Galatians and in Romans. James is basically saying when God has justified the sinner, the sinner is different. They're changed. And their lives are different. And this isn't legalism. This is the natural progression in sanctification. Nobody is saved by their works. We agree with that. But when a person is saved, there will be works that testify to the fact that God has saved. In verses 42 and 43, John says, Many of these authorities, quote, believed in Jesus as Messiah, but did they really believe unto salvation? Back to James 2. You say you believe in God, you do well. Even the demons believe that. Or you believe that God is one? Even the demons believe that. Even the demons are right in, in their doctrine there. But they're not saved. I think there's two things that will answer this question. Were these genuine believers? And I'll just tell you from my perspective, I don't think we're talking about very immature believers, at least at this moment. Now, could some of them have become believers later? I, yeah, that's very possible. I don't think we're talking about believers in this particular moment. The authorities feared other men. They, they fear Pharisees. Now, we've seen this just months before at the Feast of Booths when the man who had been healed from blindness was what? Kicked out of the synagogue, remember? And that was a big deal. That ruined your life, so to speak. So these men are saying, yeah, we believe that Jesus uh, is, is actually the Messiah. He has claimed this, and we believe it, but don't say anything because there are some very powerful religious Jews that could make our lives a mess. And then John says they would not confess. The word confess, homo legeo, saying in perfect agreement with what God says. Now folks, let me, let me just say this. If God has said something, it's settled. Whether you and I agree with it or not, it's settled. But when God says something, the believer better come along and say, yes, I agree. I confess that same thing. These men don't do that. Why do they not do that? Because they feared losing their position. If I openly confess Jesus right here and right now, then I'm done. And Jesus has made that call before. Look, you're going to follow me or somebody else. Who are you going to follow? You've got to be willing to lose it all to follow me. Yeah, but I'm not. See, Lord, I've got some influence. I've worked really hard to get where I'm at. And, and if, if I confess you, then I could lose all of that. And I just go back to one of the sayings of Jesus. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world but to forfeit his soul? You can gain it all. You can have monuments erected in your honor, colleges named after you, hospital wings dedicated to you, scholarships given in your name 50 years after you're dead. And what does it matter if you're separated from Christ forever under his judgment? What does it matter for? Is it really worth having that little bit of acceptance and praise from fellow sinners? No, it isn't. And that's what you're going to have to come to. Now, in my own life, and I'm not telling you, you have to do exactly what I did, but I remember it so distinctly when I regard to his call, and I wanted to go build my name, my, my Tower of Babel, if you will. And I thought that the way that I could do that best was through radio. So I went into secular radio, and I had every intention, though foolishly, of thinking, I'm going to be somebody. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move from Chattanooga to Atlanta and someday to Los Angeles, and I'm going to be somebody big. Now, now think about that. I'm as hillbilly and podunk as it gets. You really think Los Angeles is going to let me be on, their, be on their radio stations? No. But at that time in my life, that's what I thought. And I remember when the Lord made me miserable. He said, you're either going to keep going this way or you're going to follow me. You, you, can't, you can't dabble in the world and follow me too. You can't do it. And I had a car payment. It was under $300, but at that time it was still a lot to me. And I remember thinking, Lord, whew. Don't know how you're going to overcome this obstacle, but here we go. 
turned in my notice. And I was scared. And I'm not saying that you have to leave your job. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But I could not. It was a Saturday night. I was teaching Sunday school the next morning, but on Saturday night, I, I had to read. I was on the air for five hours, and two times an hour, I had to promote going to the topless bar. I had to do it five times, and then I had to promote going to whichever club and getting as drunk as you could. And I, I was eaten alive, and I said, I can't keep doing this. And I don't know what God's going to do from here on out, but I know I can't keep going down this road. Folks, that's much less severe than what we're talking about here. But regardless, that's what it's going to come to. You want to get here, but what will you have to give up to get there? If, if, if you're not following Christ to get there, you don't want it. You really don't want it. These authority figures loved not only their position and feared losing it, but John says they loved the glory that came from men more than that which comes from God. And I get it. It's nice to be praised. You want to hear people say, good job. You want people to, to say, man, there's such and such. I get it. I know. But I'm going to close this particular point. Don't worry, we've got one more, but it won't be long. The Apostle Paul in Galatians, first thing he deals with is the importance of, of having the right gospel. And he's talking to Gentiles who had professed to believe the gospel, but then when Paul left, some other Jews came in and said, well, that's not the full gospel. It's faith plus works, you know, faith plus keeping the law. You've basically got to become Jewish. And Paul attacks that. And then in verse 10 of, of Galatians 1, Paul says, am, am I striving to please men? Am I still? I, I used to. That's what I lived for. I thought I was living for God, but really I was hungry for the praise of men. But if I were still striving to please men, I could not be a bondservant of Christ. And notice how definitive that is in Galatians 1.10. If I'm striving to be accepted by people, striving for their praise, for their glory, then I cannot be a bondservant of Christ. I cannot straddle the fence here. Cannot. It will either be Christ who has my allegiance or someone else. And Paul says, it is Christ. He has my complete allegiance. I do not think that the people that John describes in these two verses are believers, at least at that time. I hope that later that changed. But in that moment, even though it says that they believe, I do not believe it was saving faith. So here's what I would say. Check your faith. If you are not willing to openly confess Jesus as God the Son, the Messiah, why not? I didn't say if you work at Costco that you've got to go in on Monday morning with a I love Jesus shirt and just yelling at people. I'm not saying that you have to go to your job and, and, and have a little microphone and speaker with you and just yelling at them. But, but folks, there, there's a willingness of the believer to say, yes, I am a Christ follower. If, if the five people who know you best were absolutely astonished to hear that you're a Christian, something's wrong. What? Really? Huh. Well, maybe I am too then. You've got to openly confess Christ. There's no room not to. Well, Darryl, you're a preacher. It doesn't matter. I was doing this before I was a preacher. This is about being a follower of Jesus, a believer. Check your faith. Are you willing to openly confess Jesus as Lord and God or not? Because nothing in the Bible suggests that secret Christianity is optional. Nothing. Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a private Christian. What does that even mean? That's about as good as the, well, I'm a carnal Christian. I mean, years ago, people used to think that. The King James Version had there in Corinthians, they inserted the word carnal. Why? I don't know. I mean, oh, I'm a carnal Christian. Oh, okay. Well, you can be immoral. No, you can't. Well, I'm a private Christian. No, doesn't work. Third and finally, verses 44 to 50. Jesus' final address to the crowds. And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. I've come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. 
If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. But don't stop there, because that's not the full point. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. Verse 49, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know, catch that, and I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. When we started this section, Jesus made statements and then went away. There's an interlude here. I know we don't actually read it, but there's an interlude. And John is making a connection to the prophet Isaiah and how uh, there would be people who would have sufficient evidence but not believe. Well, now, without even being told, Jesus is back on the scene. I don't know how much later, but he's back on the scene. And he's addressing the crowds. And, and from John's perspective, this is the last address, folks. Because we're about to step into chapter 13, and you have chapter 13 through 17 as part of one night. In chapter 18, he's going to be arrested. Chapter 19, he's going to be crucified. This is his final address. Catch that. Verses 44 and 45, he literally screams. That's the word cried out. It means to scream. Not belligerent, but just, I think for volume's sake, screams out these next words. He puts belief in him as first and then moves to sight. In both instances, Jesus, again, is claiming to be sent from God the Father. Those who believe in Jesus are believing the Father. Whoever sees Jesus is seeing the Father. His proclamation of being the Son of God cannot be seriously questioned even by those who don't believe in him. And what I mean by that is this. Well, I, I don't know if there's a single verse that says that. Folks, he says it over and over. He, he claims this over and over to be the one sent from the Father. He does make the claim to be the Messiah. Verse 46, Jesus speaks about why he came into the world. He has come as light. Remember, way back in John chapter 1, we were there just a year ago. It's called the prologue, verses 4 and 5. He talks about him as this light. But he has come so that whoever believes in him will not remain in darkness. That's lostness and death. Jesus came to save those in darkness. And then in verses 47 and 48, he addresses those who hear his words but do not keep them. These will be judged. Jesus is trying to emphasize his purpose to save rather than judging, but they will be judged. Those who reject he and his words already have a judge. It's what he's already said. They will be judged on the last day. And rightly so. In the Sermon on the Mount, that's Matthew 5 through 7. Jesus gives the, the lengthiest sermon that we have recorded in the Gospels. And at the very end, it seems like this detached thing, but it's not detached at all. Jesus closes that sermon with this illustration, the, the man who built houses. He says there's one who builds on the rock, one who builds on the sand. Remember that? What Jesus is doing there is that's his closing of the sermon. I've told you all of these things. And here's how I'm closing it, summing it up. How you respond to my words are going to tell the tale. Are you going to be like the man who built his house on the rock so that when the winds and the storms came, the waves hit it, it stood? Or will you be like the fool who doesn't keep my words and you build your house on sands, on the sands, and then the winds come and destroy it and, and great as its fall, it's done. That, that's how he closes the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard my words. Some of you have even witnessed the miracles I've performed to back up my claims. If you think that you can reject me and be fine, you won't be. Well, you just said you weren't you wasn't going to judge. No, no. I'm emphasizing salvation, but I'm going to judge on the last day. Those who reject Jesus will be judged, folks. That's going to happen. You're going to go to churches that don't even want to touch that reality. I get it. It's not pleasant. But there's a hell that's real. And there are going to be people that go there. And not because they weren't good enough. Because none are good enough. They're going to go because 
God. They are responsible for their response to God. But God is sovereign. He is sovereign, but we are responsible. Verses 49 and 50, Jesus pushes his words on his authority given from God the Father. He has consistently claimed to be doing and saying that which the Father has given him to say and do. And he concludes with this awesome statement in verse 50, And I know, I am resolved, resolute, I know that his commandment is eternal life. Oh, how good that is. Jesus is referring to God's commandment, which is eternal life. And folks... Jesus is that very eternal life. Believe him and you have it. Reject him and you don't. It's that cut and dry. So I would take these words of Jesus and let them sink in deeply. Jesus knows that his father's commandment is eternal life. He knows it. Doesn't wish it. Doesn't think it. He knows it. And that is enough. We have sufficient Sufficient evidence to believe. We do. Well, Terrell, I don't know, man. You, you read some of this stuff. I mean, raising a guy after four days of death. I mean, you, then let's go to the Old Testament. Man, there's some hard stuff there. I know. I don't. I do. I get it. But here's where it leaves you. Who are you going to believe? You're going to believe someone. Well, I think I'm going to go with Richard Dawkins. He wrote that book, The God Delusion. Yeah. Ooh, okay. Uh, no. Well, there's some people that have brought out some, some really uh, challenging questions. Sure they have. Sure they have. Jesus made the claim to be sent from God the Father and that He is God the Son. And we have sufficient ev evidence to say that He was a real person, not just a figment of someone's imagination that he did all of these things and that he did go to a cross and die, that he was buried and that he was raised from death. That he's ascended and coming back. You're either going to believe that or something else. You can't do both. Jesus says, I know that his commandment is eternal life. To my family in Christ, Jesus knows that his Father's word is eternal life. That ought to cause us to rejoice. He is the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. Eternal life is his to give and he has given it. Hallelujah. Bask in him in this wonderful truth. God is saved. You are his and he is yours. Hallelujah or not? I mean, really? Fellow believers, may we be bold to proclaim God's word even in a world of skepticism sarcasm, flat-out unbelief, because we have others who came before us, Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, faithful in preaching God's Word, even though they knew the audiences would not listen. And what about Jesus himself? He preached and was rejected by many. In all of these instances, they knew that people would not believe, but they also knew that God had sent them to preach. To proclaim and we must do the same thing we must be faithful in following him proclaim the gospel and know that God is still saving us he is unbeliever you have all the evidence that you really need well if God would move a chair the reason to, to doubt you have sufficient evidence to take him at his word you really do he has spoken, acted, and recorded these things. In today's text, most of the people addressed, I think, were unbelievers. Yet there are always those within the crowd who will believe. God is exactly who he has claimed to be. And you are exactly who God says you are. You need a savior. You need a rescue. And Jesus Christ is your only hope. So far you've rejected him, unbeliever. But today can be the day of salvation for you. Repent of your sins and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and he will save you. I can't improve on that. Jesus Christ is the Savior. May God save you.
today. Would you bow with me? Father, I know that uh, this has been difficult to listen to. I knew it was going to be difficult to preach. I stand by it. Lord, that doesn't mean that I can't receive any correction. That doesn't mean that that I never mess up. I, I know those are realities. God, I have tried to honor you. I really have. I have. Lord, I've asked you, even before I got up here to preach, that what I would say would be pleasing to you first and foremost, even if no one else liked it. It's still my heart's desire. I don't have everything figured out. I'm trying to learn, and I know that you have given me the Holy Spirit teaching me and guiding me, but Lord, I'm still in the process. Lord, show us again and again that you are worthy to be praised even when we don't understand everything about you. Even in the hard things, even in the, the difficult text, you are God and you are worthy of worship. And with such a topic that can be really distressing, Lord, we think about lost loved ones and we think, God, do they have any hope? I mean, you're sovereign and they're responsible. Do they have any hope? Lord, the answer is yes. Because Christ is saved, is the Savior. Do what we cannot, but send us to proclaim what we can proclaim. And we will praise you because you are worthy of that. Amen.